with that, not seeing any questions, let me um, um, get started with that preview. So this, there is an organizing principle between unit three and four. You can kind of see it in the title. One says classical physics, the other says modern physics. And that's the organizing principle between unit three and four. Um, there is a dividing line between classical physics and modern physics. Um, one of which is the time, <laughs> the development of modern physics uh, took place around the turn of the 20th century, the beginning of 20th century. So modern physics is about 100, 120 years old. And um, that was a time of a lot of new developments, a lot of perplexing phenomena and, um, and all which resulted in development of quantum mechanics and special relativity. And, those, the developments that took place then really changed the way people think about physics. It really changed the philosophy of physics. So, so we use that as the dividing line. The time before then is classical physics. <laughs> the time after that is modern physics. And the things that we knew in classical physics, they still have influence and you know sometimes there are situations well many situations uh, are well described by classical physics i think uh, your chapter one covered that um and those are quite common everyday situations so we continue to learn classical physics and what a lot of modern physics amounts to is a modification of things we know in classical physics. So like electricity and magnetism, that's still very important and that's why we still teach it and learn it. Um, but um, I guess so one philosophical difference that I would highlight is uh, when I was talking about mechanics, I mentioned the philosophy of determinism oh, that the idea that if you have a system of stuff and you know enough about the system, you have complete knowledge of um, all the forces that will be acting on things, then how you might be able to predict the state of the system into indefinite future. And so, so the future is already determined, that's the determinism. And that's the kind of philosophy that would have been supported by uh, things that we see in classical physics in maybe not quite so much in thermodynamics, but definitely electricity and magnetism, study of gravity. Um, they, um, nothing in the theory, um, nothing in the theory confronts the idea, presumption that you can have complete knowledge about a system and using the complete knowledge, predict the future with <laughs> no uncertainty. And, um, and that's one of the things that we had to give up when we learned mod modern physics. In fact, in quantum mechanics, one of the things that we'll talk about is the uncertainty principle how certain amount of uncertainty, certain, I need better thesaurus, um, that part of some kinds of uncertainty is built into nature. That such a thing as complete knowledge about a uh, system is, it's a theoretically impossible. So, 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 so that's, uh, the, um, that's the beginning of modern physics, recognizing our limitations. So, so um, I think you see quite a few, of, a few philosophically minded people discuss quantum mechanics and its impact on philosophy. And uh, there are some reason for that because the physics before quantum mechanics was a completely deterministic physics um, the, as in you know, in theory, you could do away with all the uncertainties and errors. The physics with the quantum mechanics is a probabilistic theory. The theory predicts a probability of something happening. And there are many situations where, um, you know, probability of a particular event happening is 100%, it's 90%, it's a 50%. <laughs> so there's a 50%, 10% chance of the other thing happening. And, um, and all that the best theory in the world can give you is the prediction of the probability 
not certainty of which outcome will happen. So with a, a quick description, quick-ish <laughs> description of the divide between classical and modern physics, this is what we do cover in classical physics. Um, so th there are some more that we could cover, but this is where, um, these are the topics that I thought were important for us to cover. Oh, I see a question, let's see. Oh, <laughs> it's why lots of people get into quantum computing and confused when they don't get a hard result for their <laughs> set of outcome probabilities. Yeah, and the, the ideas in quantum computing are, you know, it's uh, quite uh, distinct from classical computing, you know, cl and it's a, uh, um, yeah, <laughs> I'll just leave that there. <laughs> because there are certain algorithms that will run on a quantum computer that you simply cannot run on a classical computer. Because uh, um, we do those quantum states. Uh, I don't know if I'm doing this description justice. Uh, sometimes you can run um, parallel computation, par almost infinite number of parallel computations that would uh, take you know, infinite number of processes in a classical computer. But if you arrange the qubits right, then you can run such an algorithm on a quantum computer. It's a, yeah. I have other things to say about quantum computer, but I'll leave that elsewhere. Classical physics. So um, we are really covering two main things here, or hmm, we're covering one thing, which is uh, thermal physics. Um, which is, I think, a practical in from in practical terms. This is probably the most uh, important thing that we cover in in this class, because <laughs> uh, thermal physics they relate to heat engines, and um, heat engines are they are they probably have more influence in modern life than anything else, because heat engines are what generates our electricity. Well, most of our electricity. Um, a lot of renewables don't use the heat engines, but we are still using a lot of fossil fuel, um, even nuclear reactors. Uh, at some point in their uh, power generation, they use a heat engine. Uh, what heat engines do is that they use flow of heat, um, uh, flow of heat from hot to cold uh, in uh, contraption to uh, divert some of the flow of energy into mechanical work. And that mechanical work can do useful things. So, so what we study in, or what we describe in thermodynamics or thermal physics is how all of that works and um, how these heat engines have very limited efficiency. So, um, so, so we cover thermal physics, and as you see, even in the topic headings, uh, energy plays a very important role in study of thermal physics. It, uh, um, uh, so, so it introduces a, a form of energy that we haven't quite dealt with in mechanics, thermal energy. Um, that can be described through temperature of a system and all that stuff, <laughs> and and um, and um, we talk about how you can uh, generate mechanical work that we've been talking about in mechanics uh, from flow of heat. So that's one. <laughs> And the remainder of classical physics, we are quite focused on the theory of electromagnetism. Now, it looks like it's divided into three chapters. And, uh, you know, to a great deal uh, of extent, uh, how we cover it in this class, it'll look like three separate things. Uh, in chapter 10, we cover electricity, you know, um, electric charge, like a static electricity, how uh, electric charges interact. Um, and, and in chapter 11, we talk about magnetism, uh, permanent magnet, and all the stuff you can do with the permanent magnet, and maybe magnetic field lines uh, that look similar to what you might have seen if you ever played with a bar magnet and a, a, a iron filing. Now, what connects electricity and magnetism is at the most fundamental level, what produces magnetic field is electrical current. And 
electrical current that we described at the second half of chapter 10 uh, with the conductors and the current through the conductors. So, so there's a connection between magnetism and electricity. And drawing all this connection, it does take quite a bit of math. So we <laughs> kind of try to uh, have our discussion around that so that we don't have to bring in calculus. <laughs> um, but I will try to hint at that connection, the you know magnetic field produced by current, that's one. Magnetic force on a current carrying conductor is another one. Um, because this is where something feels a force from a magnet and there's nothing magnetic there. Uh, the only thing that's magnetic is current, electrical current. And the topic that properly marries these two topics, electricity and magnetism is light. This is uh, um, probably the one of the greatest accomplishments in the 19th century physics that uh, it uh, the guy who gets credit is uh maxwell what's his first name <laughs> i forget his first name <laughs> um, uh, james clark maxwell um he is he um he he, he developed a unified theory of electricity and magnetism. And in the process of developing that unified theory of electricity and magnetism, he predicted uh, that, that you could have an, a wave of electricity and magnetism or wave of an electric field and magnetic field. And, um, and when he finished predicting it, he realized that the, the electromagnetic wave that he is predicting would move at this very fast speed. And by then, astronomers have measured the speed of light in um, orbital motion of things. And, um, and he predicted that um, the electrom he he guessed that the electromagnetic wave that he was predicting that it was light. And I don't think he, uh, he saw his uh, prediction confirmed before he died, but it was um, not long after it was confirmed. And so, um, so we lead the chapter on light with this section to highlight how light unifies our theory of electricity and magnetism. And this is a, quite a recurring theme in physics. You could almost say we are still living in the shadow of the, uh, the development that was started with this unification of electricity and magnetism. If you ever heard of a grand unified theory, that's kind of where this comes from. Um, our physicists first taste in unification of uh, our theories was with electricity and magnetism. So instead of two separate theories, one describing electricity, another describing magnetism, we have a single unified theory of electromagnetism. Now, having said that the rest of the chapter, especially with the reflection, refraction, it doesn't really have much to do with um, electricity and magnetism because light is fun on its own. You know, if you ever played with a magnifying glass, you know what I'm talking about. Like you didn't have to understand that it involved electric and magnetic field to have fun with the burning paper and stuff. So, um, so. Um, so, but we do cover light and in some fundamental way, all these three chapters are connected. Um, and I think, so, so as we get through unit three, I think by the end of week 11, I think, week 11, week 12, um, you know, through unit three, it'll, uh, what we cover will seem, very rushed that we don't have, we don't spend a lot of time on any one single topic, and uh, and there is a reason for that. I really want you to make sure that we had our last uh, uh, quarter, <laughs> last uh, four weeks of a semester available to cover modern physics. So I guess it'll still feel rushed. But <laughs> um, given the choice of uh, spending all sixteen weeks through classical physics, you know, 
physics that makes a lot of intuitive sense and uh, is the basis of the philosophy of determinism uh, and ending things there um, with maybe a little bit of time to spare and choice between that and one where it feels a little bit rushed, but where you have some amount of time to consider modern physics. I thought it would be better for you to have seen modern physics in this context of a physics class. Because a lot of things in quantum mechanics and special relativity, if you read about it in you know popular science magazine or whatever, very often they mischaracterize certain things. And I want you to, you to have a place where you can learn these things without any hype, just to, you know, what, what they are. Because just what they are itself is already very, uh, it does contain a lot of mystery, things that we don't fully understand. Un uncertainty principle, we fully understand that. Uh, what we um, do struggle with is the, um, the, well, wave particle duality, I guess it's not, necessarily that mysterious these days, but the boundary between when these quantum mechanical effects, the wave nature of matter really matters. And um, when we can describe things classically, that's uh, still something that's an area of active research. Um, so so I, I think a quantum mechanics is one thing that uh, takes a lot of care to learn it and learn it properly. <laughs> so, so we are heading there by week 12 or week 13. And uh, special relativity is a lot of fun. Uh, I, um, I think uh, just uh, learning the relativity of simultaneity alone is, um, I, I think if uh, you are somehow able to fully grasp that, that relative, the simultaneity is relative, that alone will be an accomplishment for this conceptual class. Uh, well, it will be an accomplishment for you. Um, and the uh, uh, last bit of chapter 15, it covers some things. I think it, um, we have uh, quite a few people taking this class because we are preparing for radiology and other, uh, you, you know, other uh, allied health fields. This chapter is why they are making you take this class uh, because we'll talk about uh, radioactivity and <laughs> biological effects of ionizing radiation. I I'm sure in the radiology technician class, they will cover this <laughs> themselves in a more proper technical detail, but um, I hope this chapter will be your, um, uh, if you haven't seen it already, that it'll be an adequate first introduction to these topics. So, so we are getting there. Uh, we have the rest of the semester, but this is the 20 minute preview <laughs> of um, what I can talk over for now. So uh, that's uh, everything I had and that's probably all the time we have. Now we unfortunately don't really get into quantum computing in this class, but um, yeah, I guess. Yeah, quantum computing, quantum information, that's a, its own thing. I, I remember when I was in uh, graduate research, there were research groups in the physics department that was doing quantum information. And I have to tell you that the topics that they were doing research on looked very different from the kind of physics that I was doing, which was AM of physics, which dealt a lot with the quantum mechanics, but, you know, laters. <laughs> Um, oh, but uh, there is some connection. I think some of the qubits are built using uh, AMO physics um, stuff. 